Uh, and now we have Sam coming to speak for us. Hello, everyone. Um, I am super excited to be speaking to you today. I really appreciate being invited to participate in this event. As you can probably tell from my accent, like AJ, I am over in the US and I am going to be talking today about some of my experiences as a queer person and in STEM and sort of how those two things ran parallel to each other. And I'm also going to be giving a very condensed version of the queering biology talk that I've given previously at OSTEM and at other conferences. And so now I'm going to share my screen. Um, cool. So uh, the talk today that I'm gonna give is called Queering Biology. And like I said, it will have two sections. And before I give that talk, I want to give a land acknowledgement for where I am right now um, in my bedroom, which is on stolen land that's the current home to four federally recognized Native nations in the US, um, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska. And I give this land acknowledgement both because it's important to acknowledge the land I'm on and also because some of the things that I'm talking about relating to cultivating respectful attitudes and practices to support sex and gender diversity are very necessary for a variety of reasons, including the fact that missionaries and colonizers have hist historically targeted, stigmatized, and oppressed indigenous people for having cultural gender roles beyond the male-female binary, and this form of violence continues today. So when I present on clearing biology, I like to use this quote from the feminist scholar, Dr. Sarah Ahmed to start off. And the quote reads, we learn about worlds when they do not accommodate us. Not being accommodated can be pedagogy. We generate ideas through the struggles we have to be in the world. And we come to question worlds when we are in question. And I like this quote a lot, both in terms of how it applies to some of the work that I've been doing on how to make teaching biology more inclusive but also it relates a lot to my story of how I got here and why I think all of this is important and why it feels personally compelling. And I don't always talk about what got me into doing this, but I feel like this is a very appropriate time to talk about that. So for the next part of the presentation, I'm going to share a little bit of my own story. And ideally I would like to not have this much text on the slides, but this is um, a new thing for me. So. I have quite a bit of text just to make sure I don't get lost. So beginning at the beginning for me, so what worlds did I move through and what questions did they cause me to ask? So how did I get here? These are some pictures of me as a little kid and I was always intensely curious about the world around me. Um, the picture on the right is I think my Halloween costume. When I was about five, I wanted to be an anatomically correct dragonfly. <laughs> um, and as a child, like many queer people, I always felt somehow different, but I didn't have the words to explain why for many years. And when I was a teenager, I was able to learn more words to describe different genders and sexualities, but I still wasn't sure which of those fit me. And I started to become aware that people expected me to perform and identify with gender in a specific way but it really didn't feel right. And people expected me based on that gender to have a particular sexual orientation. And that definitely didn't feel right, but it was hard for me to imagine an alternative or feel any sense of certainty about who I was. And at the same time, I also felt not only that my sense of self was different from other people, but there were some things about my body that was different. And I was very ashamed that my body was also not cooperating with my assigned gender and I didn't understand why that was happening. And while I was going through all of this turmoil and teenage angst about my identity, I continued to be very interested in life on earth. And as I took more science classes in high school, I realized that I wanted to study biology. 
and I went to college. I had a really good time in college. I finally met other queer people and I was able to come out for the first time. I at the time was identifying as a lesbian and it felt really good to not have to spend all of my time taking away my personality so people wouldn't notice I was queer. But even after I came out and people knew that about me, it still didn't feel completely right. I still felt different in a way I couldn't explain. And I continued to notice things about my body that weren't typical, and I started talking to some doctors about it, but they were not able to give me any answers. And while I was in college, I studied biology and I conducted plant genetics research. The picture on the right of the slide is me surrounded by these little plastic plates that I used to grow tiny plants for some of my experiments. And I really loved doing this research and I wanted to keep asking more questions about it and keep learning more. And that curiosity prompted me to go to graduate school and I got into a PhD program at Kansas State University. And the year before I started, I finally got a diagnosis for what was going on with my body. Um, but the doctor who I saw basically told me the name of this thing and then left the room. And that, that really didn't answer a lot of my questions. Um, and the, the graduate program I got into was in a fairly small town in Kansas, which is a pretty conservative area. And I was nervous to move there and I often felt alienated as a queer person in that environment, especially after the US 2016 election. And one of, I guess, the upsides to being in that challenging situation was that I was very deliberate about seeking out queer community and making sure that even if I, uh, the overall climate I was in was kind of hostile, that I had queer and trans friends and I met some really amazing people. And I continued studying plants in graduate school. And uh, the picture on the right of this slide is me wearing a shirt, but I really like it. says support Hardy Weinberg, mate randomly getting ready to do some RNA extraction. And I also started teaching undergraduate courses as part of my TA ship. And that was really cool. I realized I love teaching. And while there were some positive things about my first two years in grad school, there were also a lot of really negative things. I won't go into super detail about it, but it's basically a very, very hard year for a variety of reasons. And all of the things that had made me feel alienated from the world before and called into question sort of intensified. And there were times where I felt like I didn't belong in the world at all. But during this period of really intense struggle, that also led me to question pretty much everything about my life, including things that I'd been afraid to question before because now I felt like I didn't have a choice but to ask those questions. And at the end of that year, a lot of things changed. So I, in the same week, um, switched graduate advisors, switched to a new lab and came out as a non-binary trans person. And over the course of that year, I changed my name, I changed my pronouns, I dramatically changed my experience and I started um, experimenting with performing as a drag king, which was a really lovely way to play with gender in a kind of supportive and lower stakes environment than like doing gender in my normal slash science life where the stakes are very high sometimes. And it wasn't like my whole coming out process happened in one go. It, it took a lot of trial and error for me to sort of realize things like, okay, I don't like these pronouns anymore. What would it be like to try new ones? I don't like this name anymore. What other name can I use? Do I actually want short hair? Um, how do I want to dress? And how do I change the way I, I hold myself and use my voice? Um, and while this was happening and I was finally being more honest with myself about my gender and who I needed to be to survive in the world, I grew increasingly frustrated with some of the things that my job was asking me to do. So I was really enjoying my teaching role, but I was growing increasingly frustrated with having to teach this very binary version of sex, gender, and sexuality through the biology curriculum, because the more that I got to know myself and other queer people, 
the more that I felt like that just really wasn't accurate or representative and I was doing myself and my community a disservice. And I started to question whether there might be a more inclusive way to teach biology. And that brought me to really looking outside the box. I'd never taken a gender, women and sexuality studies course before my third year of graduate school, but I was really lucky to find some professors in that department who were willing to serve as mentors to me and sort of gave me tools to be able to question and challenge some of the norms of biology education, because I feel like in STEM, a lot of times we're taught that textbooks should not be questioned and the information in them is capital T truth even though textbooks can be inaccurate, um, the general consensus about what is true in biology can change. We're always learning more. And biology is very much influenced by culture and prejudice. And learning that I had permission to question that was really liberating and really important for me. And as I started to learn more about how to do LGBTQIA plus inclusive biology, I wanted to talk about it with other people and share what I was learning and see what other people knew. And there was not a whole lot of opportunity to do that at my university. So I started presenting at conferences about it, maybe before I should have, just because I was really excited, even if I didn't necessarily have a lot of expertise. And through doing those presentations, I met other people who were doing similar work and I was able to learn from them and really engage with them. And the more that I learned, the more that I realized that biology is actually already very queer. We don't need to queer biology. We can just let it be what it already is. Um, and so a lot of the things that I thought were either misunderstandings or were the default actually have very specific histories. And um, like with many things, the history trace is back to eugenic and colonial projects that were used to deny biodiversity and impose hierarchies on human diversity. And that trickles down to how we look at other taxa as well sometimes. And after several years of doing this, I designed my own course called Questioning Biology that I taught in the Gender, Women and Sexuality Studies department at my university last year, which was a fascinating experience to be um, the primary instructor for a course for the first time when we had to go completely virtual halfway through due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And just to sum up this part of the talk, I don't always talk about my personal story when I share this information, but I feel like it's really essential because I don't separate my queerness and my identity as a scientist. For me, they're very much connected and I believe that I'm a better biologist because my Queerness has, as Sarah Ahmed suggests, brought me to question things about why I and others were not accommodated in the world or in this discipline. And through my biological knowledge and access to this information, I've come to better understand my own queerness and how I'm part of um, biological variation. And so after years of reading about biological sex variation, I was able to realize that not only am I a trans person because my gender doesn't match the sex I was assigned at birth, but my body really doesn't either. And so finally, really for the first time in 2020, being able to understand myself as both trans and intersex has finally allowed me to live, teach and work most authentically. And by that I mean most authentically for now, because I think my self understanding will continue to evolve and change over time. But I finally feel like there aren't pieces that I have to leave behind, which is really awesome. And all of this has led me to feel a deep connection with the diversity of life on Earth because so many of the organisms that we share the planet with are like me, neither other and or both male and female. And so that's a little bit about my story and now I'm going to talk about some of the questions this experience has led me to ask about biology and biology education and some of the ways that I think we can allow biology to be queer and create a more inclusive environment for queer people in biology. And this part of the talk can be a whole hour on its own, so I'm going to try and do about 10 minutes of it and then I'll be happy to take questions. So a question that I ask um, other queer people and then I ask educators 
is how are we teaching things like sex, gender, and sexuality and biology now and who gets left out of it? So a lot of times, both in my experience as a student and a teacher, I saw biological sex taught like this. So biological sex is chromosomal binary determined entirely at conception and cannot be changed in any way. Um, sex and gender are often conflated. So this is showing people with certain sets of chromosomes being given gendered terms and human reproduction is represented as based on these heterosexual relationships um, focused on producing offspring. And oftentimes this type of content is the only thing we get about sex, gender, and sexuality from our biology textbooks. And that implicitly normalizes people who are endosex, people who are heterosexual, and people who are cisgender by saying you belong in biology, you, you get to be in the textbook. And for everyone else, um, it's sort of suggesting that, that those ways to exist are not normal, natural, or biological. And I think this is a problem both because it excludes the LGBTQIA plus community and because it facilitates biology continuing to be weaponized against queer, trans, and intersex people, which does a lot of political damage and really affects our access to rights and life chances. And so what I want to ask and explore is how can we be more accurate, comprehensive, and inclusive with how we talk about these aspects of diversity in biology. And so I think it's really unfair that many biology students do not get to learn about how really creative and vast biological sex diversity is. So just briefly, there's organisms that don't have sex or sexes. These are the Mexic New Mexican uh, whiptail lizards. They are all females and they reproduce asexually. Um, some organisms don't have two sexes, they have thousands of mating types, like mushrooms in the Basidiomycota family. There are some organisms that don't have separate sexes, like snails and most flowering plants, where the sperm and ova producing parts are in the same individual. And there are organisms that have separate sexes, but they change sex over time, like clownfish. So, um, in Finding Nemo, if it was biologically accurate, Marlin would have become Nemo's mother after his biological mother died. And biological sex varies so much between different species, and so assuming that it works a specific way across all species is really inaccurate, but I see it happening all the time um, with scientists who talk about their systems but don't clarify how sex works specifically in that system. And so I like to be really explicit about talking about it. So in organisms that generally have um, sexual reproduction, there are usually um, two different types of gametes in plants and animals that do sexual reproduction. Uh, the story is often very different in fungi, but in animals usually there is uh, one large immobile gamete and one small mobile gamete. And for organisms that produce both from one individual, that's called monoecy, which means literally one house. And in organisms that have a separate individual to produce sperm and to produce ova, that's called dioecy, so two houses. And so clarifying, are we talking about organisms that have monoecy or dioecy? And if we're talking about organisms that have dioecy, there's lots of creative ways to do sex determination. So we can do it chromosomally, we can do it based on environmental factors like egg incubation temperature, and we can even do it based on environmental factors like in the common slipper limpet. If a larva falls down and hits the ocean floor, it will be one sex, but if it falls down and lands on top of another uh, member of its species, it will be a different sex. And when talking about human biological sex, I think it's important to incorporate a lot of nuance because human sex has been so politicized. And so rather than talking about sex categories for humans, I like to talk about sex characteristics. So humans have a collection of variable traits related directly or indirectly to sexual reproduction. There are primary sex characteristics that are present at birth. Um, and usually when people are born, something like this happens. So sex is assigned based on external genital characteristics at birth. And people also have secondary sex characteristics that develop during puberty. 
And because both primary and secondary sex characteristics vary along a spectrum and somebody might have an interesting combination of sex characteristics that don't necessarily fit into one of the two expected boxes, a lot of people are intersex, which means that they have bodies that defy a common understanding of sex as a simple male-female binary. I like this definition a lot. It comes from intersex activist Pigeon Pagonis. And the general figure that's thrown around is about 2% of the population worldwide is intersex, which is about the same amount of people um, who have green eyes. But depending on how you define intersex, a much higher percentage of the population could fall into this category. And I'm happy to talk more about that later in the questions. And so this is something called the Quigley scale that's used to categorize external genitals of individuals with androgen insensitivity syndrome. But I show this because I think a lot of people don't realize that external genital structures can actually vary along a spectrum, just like all of the other biological sex characteristics. And so this is an infographic from Scientific American about some aspects of the human sex, sex, sex spectrum. Um, it's too small to see well, but I recommend looking it up if somebody ever tells you that, oh, sex is simple, just XXXY, it's actually a lot more complicated. Um, and then I want to talk briefly about how I talk about gender from my perspective and positionality as a scientist, usually to other scientists who are skeptical of this. So there's lots of different ways to talk about gender um, and some common questions people ask are how many genders are there? How can I tell what someone's gender is and why talk about gender in biology? And so I like to define gender as a form of self-knowledge that occurs within a cultural context. So looking at the gender categories culturally available, do I feel like I belong to any of them? Multiple, none of them. And many historical and modern cultures have more than two accepted gender categories, so gender is always culturally situated. And many people make choices about gender that affect their biology, so I don't like to talk about a complete separation of gender and sex because I think for a lot of people they interact, especially for trans people who might choose to change their sex characteristics to affirm their gender. And I often tell other biologists who feel uncomfortable talking about this, that if you don't talk about gender, when you teach biology, you actually are talking about gender because you're leaving the message that sex is real, sex is determining, and the conflation of sex and gender that's really ubiquitous is biological truth. So like we saw in that example from the textbook, using gender terms to describe chromosomal status and just clarifying that gender is not determined by and is not identical to biological sex assigned at birth, I think is enough to challenge that from a biological perspective. And going further than that is awesome, but just like, um, this is mostly something that I tell cis biology professors, like if saying this can go a long way. And then I just want to briefly touch on something that could fill multiple books, but I think this often goes unchallenged. So why do we have the sex and gender binary that creates problems for so many people if it's really not representative of how sex and gender actually work for humans? And so a lot of the, our modern sex and gender binary dates back to the 1800s when eugenicists claimed that certain individuals or ethnic groups were considered primitive or degenerate because they were believed to be less sexually dimorphic than um, the group that these eugenicists considered the most quote unquote evolved, which was heterosexual Europeans. And this pseudoscience called biometry or body measurements was a use, used to allege that certain groups of people, including black women, lesbians, and sex workers had atypical and anomalous sex characteristics. And that was seen as um, making them less sexually dimorphic than these supposedly more evolved heterosexual Europeans. And this, um, biometry, the pseudoscience, and this prejudicial claim was used as justification to subject these groups of people and others to experimentation and state control. And misunderstandings of biological sex that date back to these eugenic ideas are still used to justify laws and medical procedures that harm trans and intersex people, often by forcing medical procedures on intersex people to quote-unquote normalize their bodies and also withholding similar medical procedures from trans people who need them to access a more gender-affirming presentation. So um, transphobia and this violence against intersex people date back to this 
eugenic and white supremacist history and still impact state control of certain people's bodies, including people who are discriminated against for reasons that don't have to do with being queer or trans. So in the um, US in the past year, evidence came out that there were forced hysterectomies performed on women who were being detained by ICE. So a lot of these types of um, discrimination, state control and violence based on sex and gender are connected and date back to these misappropriations of Darwinism. And so it's very important to get away from these really toxic and violent and inaccurate ideas. And in addition to what I discussed before, I think there's other ways that we can all participate in allowing biology to be queer and allowing ourselves to be queer in biology and in STEM in general. And so for those of us who might be in positions of power or who might just be feeling brave enough to speak up, creating norms of asking for and using correct pronouns in spaces where we do science is awesome. Um, questioning texts and articles that rely on binaries and oversimplifications about sex and gender. As I said, um, journal articles and textbooks are not capital T truth. They are based on people's best understandings, but that can still involve misconceptions or inaccuracies. And being specific when we define and use biological sex rather than just assuming that male and female are universal categories and everyone knows what they mean in every species. Um, avoiding applying human gender stereotypes to non-human organisms. Using language focused on gametes rather than enforcing the idea of consistent universal sex categories. Um, including examples of the wide variation in how sex and reproduction can be accomplished in non-human species and advocating for LGBTQIA plus individuals in STEM diversity initiatives. And with that, I'd like to thank you all so much for listening. Um, I would love to continue this conversation. You can email me, follow me on Twitter. I don't have a lot on my YouTube channel, but I do have some short talks about sex and gender diversity that you're welcome to check out and share. And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions or comments. And I'll leave this slide up for another minute if you want to um, get any of this information. And I'm going to look at the Q&A and then look at the chat if that's okay. Yeah, oh, I'm happy to read a couple of the questions if you prefer. Okay. Um, so our kind of top question right now is how do you think your approach to querying biology education could be extended across broader STEM teaching? That's a great question. So I have not taught STEM outside of biology, but I think that some of the things that I suggested on the previous slide can be done in other STEM courses. So just creating an environment that is inclusive to queer, trans and intersex people by avoiding um, relying on sex and gender stereotypes by asking about preferred names and pronouns. In grad school, I took a statistics class and on the first day, the instructor was like, we're gonna be talking about different types of variables in class. One type is binary variables. A great example of a binary variable is gender. And I gave that professor the stink eye the entire semester <laughs> because on the first day she told me I didn't exist. Um, so avoiding things like that and I think in some other STEM disciplines, there's probably things that come up related to sex and gender. I'm just trying to think of some examples, like especially in engineering. Um, I know that thinking about sort of what kind of bodies you're designing for is often based on like very narrow ideas of either like everyone is a standard size male or like everyone is a standard size male or standard size female and like how are those things being defined and who are who are you building for and how are you defining that so challenging things like that um and there's probably a whole lot of other examples but just if something seems like it's falling into stereotypes about a sex or gender binary then questioning that and thinking about how to do it in a more inclusive way um there's also been a request if you've got any links to good resources for people who want to learn more yeah, so I, I put together a Google Doc on this, which I will um, drop in the chat. So um, you're welcome to ask the next question while I look for that. Um, 
do you think there are things in biology as a field that is getting right in this space that can be shared with other fields like best practice? Um, I think that compared to other STEM fields, biology has more representation of people who are not cis men. And I don't know if that is because of the culture of the subject matter, but I think that is a good direction to be moving in. And I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done in biology in terms of um, diversity, inclusion, and equity for people who are not white and for um, some other aspects of human diversity. But what else? Um, I think that I think that in some cases, these conversations are more close to the surface in biology, just because the subject matter has to deal with um, diversity of life. And so in some ways, it's easier to convince people that this is something that's very relevant to you. This isn't taking away from the science to talk about and include these things. And sometimes people still have those perspectives, but I feel like that's less true in biology compared to some other STEM disciplines and so just figuring out ways to have those conversations to make them compelling and relevant. Thank you. Uh, and this next one is, how would you recommend rephrasing lectures on human reproduction so it's more inclusive of intersex and trans people? That's a great question. So I think um, being very specific is important. So saying, okay, what three things do we need for human reproduction? We need two types of gametes and we need a gestational environment. And those can come from two parents, they can come from three parents and one or more of those parents might be intersex or trans. So can we talk about the specific biological structures that need to be involved in that? And talking about um, how sex is determined, that it it's a very complicated process that happens throughout gestation and other parts of sex development happen after and every part of it can vary and we can talk about those things in ways that are curious and respectful rather than pathologizing or dehumanizing or falling into this really toxic trope of showing these like black and white pictures of naked intersex people with a bar over their eyes. Mm. Uh, and then this final question is, have you ever used Joan Roughgarden's work, protect, particularly Evolution Rainbow? If not, what text do you use? Yeah, so I did use some excerpts from that book when I taught my questioning biology class. I have unfortunately still not read the whole thing, but I think it's an awesome resource just because it's so thorough. And I actually don't agree with everything she says because she writes about anim non-human animals as having gender. And I don't really agree with that, but that's okay. Like we don't all have to agree. And I really appreciate her ideas and how long she's been doing this. Brilliant. I think that was the last question in the Q&A box. Um, but th so thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's really appreciated to hear you talk. Uh, I've heard you talk do this talk in various forms many times now, and it's always great. So thank you. So much. Thank you. Um, we're now going to be taking a coffee break now. So if you'd all kind of like to join us uh, on the Gather Town, we will be still starting our next session at half past. So yeah, time to go get a break, stretch your legs and see you all soon.